Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your promise of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful always and that you're always there with us when we call for help. And so, Lord, I just ask that you will be with us this few minutes as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, um, I have some exciting news for you because we're going to go ahead and start on a new series. As you realize, last year we finished the book of John. And so this year, I thought it would be a good theme for us as we start the new year to start with the, our new series in the book of Acts. And we're going to start with the book of Acts. And just before we, we get into the book of, of Acts and study chapter 1, I want us to introduce a little bit into the context of the book and give a little bit more of a glimpse into what we're stepping into in the book of Acts. The book of Acts really is a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. And so when we look at the book of Acts, we look at at Acts as the history book of the New Testament that records the acts of the disciples of Jesus doing the miracles and preaching and organizing the church in the early church. Really, the book of Acts could have been named the Acts of Peter or the Acts of Paul, considering that the first 12 chapters, Luke only talks about Peter. And then the rest of the book is focused on the Paul's efforts of spreading the gospel. And as you notice, the last chapter in the book of Acts really ends with Paul there in prison, arrest in Rome. And so we see that Luke could have probably named this book the Acts of Peter or the Acts of Paul. In the Hellenistic era, And Hellenistic means this Greco-Roman world at that time, commemorating acts of of major figures such as Alexander or Hannibal was something that was common practice at that day. But Luke probably chose to differentiate this work from others. Instead of just naming acts of Alexander or acts of Hannibal, he makes it explicitly, and he says, no, these are the acts of the apostles, the ones who are sent off. That's the title. But it's also true that this book could have been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, right? Because without the Holy Spirit, I think that the book, the book of Acts is really non-existent. Because we really need the Holy Spirit that was acting in the lives of people and was helping them to spread the gospel and people that were filled with the Holy Spirit to do all those miracles that they did. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 70 times in, its, in the book, in its pages. And as we take a deeper look, we see that the Holy Spirit presided step by step over the geographical and the ethnic deployment of the church and its mission. So as we study the book, we see how we use the church to fulfill Jesus, and to spread the gospel message from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to Asia Minor and finally to Rome. It was through the work of the Holy Spirit that the gospel preached even to the Gentile world. We see here in this book reports of conversions of the Samaritans, of an Ethiopian, and even of a Gentile named Cornelius. Finally, the book of Acts, we see that the mission of the church is filled through the activity of the Holy Spirit being manifest in the lives of all kinds of individuals. So, what is the relationship between the promise of the Holy Spirit and the church? What is the purpose of the church? Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. But before we get there, let's do some recapping. The title of the sermon is The Promise of the Holy Spirit. But before we get there, we we notice that Jesus had told his closest disciples that he was going to ascend to heaven. 
And his, he was returning to the Father, having been resurrected. And he told them that they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And they weren't sure what all that meant, but they were there waiting with devout expectancy, with deep longing, with earnest prayer that God would fulfill his promise. And it is within this context that we read verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. He had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them his, this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here? Looking into the sky, this same Jesus who, was, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Just like the promise of the Holy Spirit was true in the ancient church, it is true for the modern church today. The mission of the church for our time is to reach people no matter who they are. The good news of salvation is for all humanity. That's the reason why the promise of the Holy Spirit is so relevant for us today. And I was so joyous when Beverly mentioned about those items. Those are opportunities that we can reach people in need. They might be items there like baby stuff, toiletries, uh, baby wipes, different things that we can give to people who are in need. So as we explore this book in the next couple of weeks, let's keep in mind two things, two words. First, mission. And number two, hope. Hope on the promises that God made to the people of the Old Testament in the fulfillment of Jesus. The hope of the coming Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, and the death and the resurrection, the work of Christ that he continues to do in our behalf and the promise of his soon return that fills our heart with hope. Really, without this hope, the emphasis of the mission is meaningless. There is no mission without this hope. And for the modern church, and for the modern Christian, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is just as true as it was for the ancient church, which brings forth three realities. Number one, the origin of the mission Number two, the power of the mission. And number three, the hope of the mission. Number one, origin of the mission. Two, power of the mission. Three, hope of the mission. First, the origin of the mission. The mission of the church is entirely rooted within the ministry of Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, we see that Jesus be, what Jesus began to do while in the book of Acts, we see what Jesus continues to do. This time through the power of the Holy Spirit. The resurrection of Jesus is the substance of the mission, for without it, there will be no mission. Because there would be nothing to announce. Jesus is at the center of the mission. If we lose perspective, if we lose the origin of, of our mission, then we lose 
our focal point and we lose and we are lost. Without Jesus being at the center, at the forefront of our mission, everything that we do and anything that we do is pointless. Jesus is the origin of the mission. Number two, it says, Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The power of the mission. In the original language, this word power is the word dunamis, strength, ability, power, from where we get our English word dynamite. Luke here refers to supernatural power received only by those upon whom the Holy Spirit comes. In other words, this dunamis came to the disciples to empower them for the purpose of witnessing. And just as it was true for the ancient church, the Spirit-given witness is to be a distinguishing mark for the modern Christian church. For you see, the passage states that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to us. Why? To be His witnesses. And who is a witness? A witness are those, who are the witnesses? Are those who can confirm for themselves what they have seen and what they have heard. Unlike the first century disciples who were the first link of visible evidence between the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord, we as followers of Jesus are called to bear personal witness of the wonderful work that He has done in our lives. And the effectiveness of the gospel is the one that we experience. One of a transformed mind. One of a transformed heart. One of a transformed life. Simply put, without personal experience, there can be no true witness. We cannot give what we don't have. It's so antithetical. It's so... It does not make sense to witness for Jesus and yet not act as Jesus or not to live as Jesus lived. Therefore, in this context, we see that the gift of power is central to the work of the Holy Spirit. Nothing can be accomplished without the power of the Holy Spirit. He comes to us as the gift and he is the one who works in in the hearts of people. And I repeat this. He is the one who works in the hearts of people because many times we try to convince people. It is not our job to convince people. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Our job is to share the news of salvation with people. Our duty as followers of Jesus is to plant those seeds of hope. The convincing, the revealing of the truth, the Holy Spirit will do that. When we observe the biblical account, we see that the disciples did not receive an it, but a him. Not a a what, but a who. The Holy Spirit descends, like Jesus said unto the disciples, with power, like a mighty wind and fire. Dunamis, ability, strength, power. The story is told of an er elderly woman who who her name was Norena who lived in southern Florida when a hurricane hit the area and her home was one of the many that was severely damaged. Norena received an insurance settlement and a repair began, however, when the money ran out. So did the contractor, leaving her unfinished home with no electricity. Norena lived in the dark with an unfinished home without power for 15 years. You see, the interesting part of this story is that it wasn't that it was a recent hurricane, but it was Andrew, a hurricane which struck in 1992. She had no heat in her home when the winter chills hovered over southern Florida. She had no air conditioning when the mercury climbed to the 90s and the humidity was 100 degrees. She did not have one hot shower Without money to finish the repairs, Norena just got by a small lamp and a single burner. Her neighbors did not seem to notice. The absence of power in her home and acting on a tip, one day the mayor mayor of Miami Day got involved. It only took a few hours to return the power to Norena's house. 
When she was interviewed, she said, it's hard to describe having the electricity to switch on. It's overwhelming. For the modern Christian church, the same is true. If we are to finish the mission and to go home, we cannot afford to live without power. We need this dunamis that was promised, that came upon the ancient church and the disciples, that changed to change the course of the history. If we want our church to be different, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. The days in which we reminisce or that we ponder or that we remember, oh, this church used to be like this. Oh, we used to have these activities. Oh, how many people used to come? Those days are long gone. It is time for the conversion and the revival to start in us first. And then when it starts from us first, then it will leap over in bounds and overflow to others. Instead of worrying about what is wrong with the church and what the church was, it's time for us as we start this new year to start fresh with a clean slate and start believing in the promise of the Holy Spirit. How else can you explain a group of 11 frightened disciples along with 120 people in a room? They were uh, frightened, they were afraid, but they were growing in such a a steep pace into a multi-ethnic, into a multilingual church on a global scale. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not my abilities, it's not my personality, it's not my charisma, it's not what I'm good at. Is, am I willing? Am I able? Is my attitude willing, open for God to use me? It's not our methods. It's not our strategies. It's not our planning. The church doesn't need any more programs. The church doesn't need any more events. We need to claim the promise of the Holy Spirit. Our mission for the world, our mission is for the world, but our world is our city. My world is my neighborhood. My world is my workplace. It is a community on the move. He says, when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Judea, in the rest of the world. Where is my Jerusalem? In my home, with my family. That's my Jerusalem. That's where Jesus has called me to work first. In my Jerusalem is my home. Where is my Judea? That's my neighborhood. Where is my Samaria? That's my workplace. And from there, he leaps over to the rest of the world. The disciples left to themselves. They would have remained fixated in in Israel. But the mission is a movement. It's the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Number two, the hope of the mission. Why hope? Because of his death and resurrection, his ascension imbues us with hope to fulfill the mission. Without Jesus and the resurrection and the event of the resurrection, there is no hope for us. We are, we are doomed. <laughs> there is no hope for us. The hope that the incarnate God ascended with a glorified body to the Father and that He will soon return for us that is mentioned in the book of Acts should beam us with hope and restoration. In the book of Acts, all the efforts to proclaim Jesus were motivated by His second coming. Are we motivated for the second coming? Do we truly want Jesus to come? Or are we just going through the motions? We're, we're so in time with our routine, so in time with the things that we're doing in this world. And Jesus is calling us to change the course of our life. So, this morning, what are the three realities of the promise of the Holy Spirit in the modern church? That the origin of the mission starts with Jesus. Jesus. That the power of the mission comes to us as a gift, which is the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of people. And that the hope of the mission lies in the death and the event of the resurrection. 
rooted in Jesus, the source of life and the hope of the soon return. The promise of the Holy Spirit was the catalyst that grew Jesus' followers from a small, frightened group to become a dynamic movement, a spirit-driven power to spread the gospel message around the world. N.T. Wright says, one of the authors that I like reading, without God's Spirit, there is nothing we can do that will count for God's kingdom. Without God's Spirit, the church simply cannot be the church. Without the Holy Spirit, the church simply cannot be the church. The book of Acts is an invitation to claim the power of the Holy Spirit, to realize the origin of the mission, to know the power of the mission, and to have hope in the mission as we come to faith in Jesus, our risen Lord, and ultimately the one to become part of the exciting mission of God. We are all ready 14 days into this year. Time flies so fast. What is God calling us to do this year that is different from last year? Will we choose commitment over convenience? Will we choose devotion over comfort? Will we go the extra mile for Jesus this year? Will we stay the course with Jesus? Or will we, or will we fall along the way and separate from Jesus? The call for us this year is to stay the course. To not let anything to get in the way. Do not let things affect us. Lord, I'm clinging to you. Lord, I want to stay the course with you, Jesus. Just me and you, Jesus. And I want you to come into my life. I don't just, I'm tired of going through the motions. I'm I'm tired of playing church. Lord, I want to transform heart. I want to transform spirits. I really claim the promise of the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to come into my life, to transform me, to change me, to renovate me. I want others to see Jesus and me. And if we do that, then we will be able to claim the power of the Holy Spirit. May we accept that promise. Our Father in heaven... That is really our prayer, that you will open our eyes. Lord, here we are. We're available. We trust you. Use us, Lord. Illuminate us. Send your Holy Spirit in our lives in such a way. And help us, Lord, that we can continue to walk humbly in your way. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.